is an IUL a bad investment? This video is meant for the individual that has came into contact with an IUL account. So whether that's some sort of advisor is trying to pitch an IUL to you, or you're trying to just do the research on your own, trying to figure out what are some of the common mistakes. So what this video is gonna do is explain to you the good, the bad, the ugly, when it comes to IUL plans and really uncover, you know, is an IUL a bad investment or is it really bad for your specific situation? So before we go into the details on whether or not it's correct or incorrect for your individual situation, what exactly is an IUL plan? And I've, an IUL is an index universal life insurance policy and it's a cash value life insurance policy. So the benefits of it is that you're placing dollars into a, a type of account set up through an insurance company and the money, the cash value within that account can grow tax free. You could pull your monies out tax free if you're doing it properly. And you could also have a tax free death benefit left to your beneficiaries, which sounds great. All those features sound fantastic, but there's some common mistakes that are made and some absolute disasters when individuals are trying to leverage an IUL plan as the one all be all. It's an asset and it has its purpose, but you have to be very careful and make sure that you're listening into the most common mistakes. And then also what are some good areas of the IUL to see whether or not it's suitable for your specific situation. At any point in time, as well as you're going through this video, if you have specific questions, feel free to give our 1-800 number a call. It's 1-800-566-1002 or you could uh, click on the calendar link, which is going to be displayed in the description of this video. So once again, to reiterate the good or to kind of expand on the good is think of this sort of account like a bucket and it's a tax-free bucket that you could leverage as just an additional asset. So typically the accounts that an individual could grow tax-free are gonna be Roth IRA accounts and then cash value life insurance. Municipal bonds are, are tricky with basically how the taxation works on it, so it's not completely tax-free, but there's ways on how you could properly structure the cash value plan, and in particular the IUL, so that it could be beneficial for your position. That's only if you do not you know, step on the landmines and step on a lot of the, excuse my language, bullshit that occurs with IUL plans. Also, you could pull out money as tax-free in retirement, you don't have to wait until age 59 and a half to do so. You could do so before age 59 and a half. And the way and how you pull these dollars out is in the form of loans. So that's another feature that when I focus in on the bad part, the loans and the different loan provisions are important to note. Because you are leveraging the tax benefits under the house of life insurance, it does have a death benefit associated with this sort of account. But the death benefit should be the least of the interest or the least of your concerns when trying to create this sort of plan, especially if you're trying to leverage it towards a growth play, towards an asset that's giving you those tax-free benefits. There's going to be a death benefit there. That death benefit can help out with estate planning needs. It's definitely beneficial, but that should not be your largest concern. That should not be the reason why you're utilizing only why you're utilizing an IUL. And the reason, the reason why I bring that up is because you could be more effective using different types of permanent or term life insurance policies to produce the optimal death benefit, the optimal death benefit need, than throwing your dollars or hoarding your dollars into an IUL plan that is not properly structured. Lastly, it's a powerful supplemental asset to leverage for retirement planning when it's properly structured. So those are the good points. What are some of the bad points? And then how can somebody, what are some examples on how somebody could leverage these accounts effectively while, while avoiding those bad points to an IUL plan and looking at it as an investment? So to help you understand what are the bad mechanisms or how these plans are set up the incorrect way, you have to understand how the cash value grows. And it grows similar to any sort of account the contributions you're placing into the plan and the rate of return that's coming back. So if you're placing dollars into this sort of account, but the net amount of contributions that are actually going into filtering into the cash value 
if those are limited because you have high costs, therefore you have less dollars going into the plan than what you desire. Less dollars going into the cash value means less cash value. If you have a low or small rate of return on that cash value, well, a smaller rate of return is going to reduce is going to produce a smaller cash value than an optimized rate of return. So the trick is to optimize both areas on the contribution side and on the rate of return side. And you do this by reducing the negatives, reducing some of those um, expenses and some of those different fees from the contribution side. And then you make sure that you're setting yourself up into the plans that will give you the best chance for growth on that rate of return side and do not have these different gotchas. Do not have these, okay, we're gonna give you this sort of mechanism, this sort of benefit, but then gotcha, we're also gonna hit you over the head with X amount of fees. And in reality, you're just going to be netting less dollars than if you just went to a, a plan that did not have these extra you know, uh, specifics or these extra features and benefits. So I'm gonna unravel what I mean by that, but just think of it like a bucket or think of it like a funnel. And the way on how this bucket or the way on how this funnel basically grows or has monies growing inside of it is by the monies you're placing in there, netting the most amount of contributions in there. So you're stripping away the least amount of cost. And then also you're trying to accentuate that growth with uh, different mechanisms that allow you to, to grow at the best possible chance of, of success. So remember that little funnel on the screen. What are the things that affect the amount of contributions, what are the costs? How are costs affected in this sort of plan? And it all goes by something known as net amount at risk, which is the risk to the insurance company. The mathematical risk that they say, we're going to be covering the death benefit portion on this individual. Yes, this individual may want to use this for a cash value maximization plan, but our risk is the death benefit. If somebody goes and puts $10,000 into a plan and they have $500,000 of death benefit, if they get hit by a bus the next week, that they only put in $10,000. Now the insurance company is has $500,000 come off of their books and go to those beneficiaries tax-free. That's not a, a good mathematical move for the insurance company. So what they do is they front end load these policies. They say in the front of these, of these plans, when individuals are, are starting off these plans and they're in the first years, really the first five to 10 years, we're going to have the most amount of fees because that's when our risk is greater. That's when our net amount at risk is the greatest possible. So if somebody gets into gets set up into a, um, a non-properly structured IUL or just we'll call it what it is, a shitty IUL plan because the advisor that was telling them to set it up, maybe that advisor jacked up the death benefit, meaning that it jacked up the amount of fees, meaning that it jacked up the amount of commissions into that advisor's pocket that translates from high death benefit means high cost, which means less net contribution. So remember that funnel. The more you contribute into the cash value, the more that gets filtered into or funneled into the cash value, the higher that your cash value could be. The less that gets filtered in there, the smaller that that cash value would be able to grow to. It's just simple math. Um, so I, I hope that, that that makes sense because if you have a $500,000 death benefit and you're putting in $10,000, less dollars are gonna go into that cash value than if you had a $100,000 death benefit and you still put in that same $10,000. So you wanna make sure that the death benefit is set up properly, but, and it's not too high of a death benefit because that's gonna translate in less dollars actually going into the contributions, uh, you know, into that bucket. The next bullet point is low caps, which translate to low growth. Remember, it goes by contributions you're placing in there and rate of return. So you'll have a whole slew possibly 100, 110 different offerings on the IUL side in your specific state. But if you have some that are, let's say, related to an S&P 500 index, and you might have, you know, because the advisor up the road or was a family friend or whatever that is, they're representing one company. And that one company says, yep, we have an S&P 500 index. And anytime that the market gains, you're going to receive a gain. Anytime that the index goes down, you're going to receive 0%. So it's giving you that same mechanism, the same concept of how this, this sort of account grows. But if that company, we'll call it company ABC, let's say that they have a cap of 7% versus another company that's offering you an S&P 500 with a cap of 17%. That's a huge difference because if the S&P 500 is up 20%, 
Company B will call it with the 17% cap. You're getting the full 17% credit in there versus the other one that's only giving you a 7% credit, even though the S&P 500 index did very well. So a lower cap results in significantly less growth. Be mindful that the indexes that are tied to these sorts of IUL plans, some years they're going to go up, some years they're going to go down. What you want to do is really capture those up years. When the, it goes down, yes, they have that mechanism of a 0% floor. Or what you might see is these mistakes of saying, we're going to give you a 1% floor, but your cap rate is 7%, as opposed to something that has a 0% floor, but the cap rate might be 14%. Do not get held up on the shiny object of, up. Oh, at least I'm always going to gain 1%. I'm always going to gain 1%. Because the years when you need that plus 14, that plus 12, that, that double digit rate of return, that's going to be a significant difference as you compound, as you're the further that you're in this sort of plan. Uh, also, loan limits mean less flexibility. So when it comes time that somebody's accumulating their dollars into an IUL plan, they want to have a long time frame to, to do that, to have those dollars fester in there and, and grow in there. When it comes time to actually pulling these dollars out, they do not want to be restricted on it. So that's where you have something known as loan provisions. You could take it out in the form of a fixed loan rate, which is known as wash loans. You could take it out in the form of an index loan rate, meaning that it, based on what the index does, you could have some sort of uncap on, on the growth uh, of your account as you're pulling monies out of this account, or maybe you might have a fixed loan rate of 5%, but yet if the index gains 10%, you're able to net that positive 5% arbitrage. There's different layers to this. Also, you have a variable loan option. So really the three main options is gonna be fixed loan rate, uh, index loan rate, and variable loan rate, which is the same sort of mechanism. You might have some sort of cap on how high that your loan rate would be when you actually start pulling your monies out. But if it's with a variable loan rate, you could have an uncapped off of how high your rate of return is on the, the indexes that, that you got set up with. So really the, the point that I'm trying to make is you have flexibility. You do not want to limit yourself. You wanna make sure that you're set up with the most amount of flexibility and you could interchange that flexibility. On some years, whenever you feel as if the market might be going down, well, maybe you might wanna take out money in the form of the fixed loan rate. Uh, on other years, you feel like that index is going to be going up, well, then leveraging the index loan rate or the variable loan rate. So different ways that allow you to pull out the monies and do it in a tax-free manner. If you try to pull monies out of an IUL in the form of withdrawals, it goes by general accounting principles, FIFO, first in, first out. So the first dollars, the contributions you're placing into that plan, those first dollars that are coming out are going to be tax-free in the form of withdrawals but anything above that is gonna be fully taxable, as opposed to if you're taking in the form of loans, the loans are not included as a tax because you're taking in the form of a loan. So you, the, the different mechanisms within, I'll just kind of explain in the most generic sense is they're, they're utilizing the death benefit as a form of collateral and utilizing your loan account as a form of collateral off of that account to allow you to receive those monies tax-free while still keeping that policy afloat. There's also ways that you could take out portions if you feel like you had really good growth on that, that cash value and you say, you know what, I want to have lifetime income off of this. So maybe I'm going to do a 1035 exchange from this cash value, a portion of it and place it into an annuity and trigger an income rider off of an annuity to give me lifetime income. It's not the most tax effective way to do it, but there's a way that you could receive lifetime income. And then the other portions you're taking in the form of loan rates to get that tax free status on there. So there's a lot of uh, really neat ways that you could skin that cat but you have to be very careful because of doing it the wrong way. Or if, let's say you only have a fixed loan rate option, that's going to be such a disservice. It's going to be such a detriment to what you're trying to accomplish to really maximize the growth and maximize the income if you're trying to utilize this as a type of uh, supplemental retirement income, especially in a tax-free manner. Um, and be mindful that different carriers offer different benefits. What makes a good carrier a good product versus a bad carrier and a bad product? Some may offer bonuses. Some may offer persistency credit, me, credits, meaning that the longer that you're in the plan, they will give you these additional, think of them in the form of bonuses, additional growth mechanisms onto your account. Also, some carriers offer uncapped indexing strategies, while other carriers offer just a very, you know, uh, one index and it's at a low cap rate. So you have to mix and match and say, okay, which ones are going to be the best for my specific situation, for my time horizon, for the time that I'm looking to pull monies or at least leverage the growth within this sort of account 
the most effective way on a tax-free basis. So, you know, every little part makes a difference because if you go into a shitty product and a shitty carrier, that's going to result in thousands of dollars going in the wrong directions, thousands of dollars going into the agent's pocket that's selling you this sort of product, and thousands of dollars going into the insurance, the carrier's pocket, uh, because, you know, you mistakenly went into that, that sort of plan, even though they were just hammering in the concept of, oh, it grows when the market goes up, doesn't lose when it goes down, gives you tax-free benefits. Yes, that's true, but if there's no way to optimize those benefits, it's, it's you know, excuse my language, I keep cursing on this video, but it's the truth. It's a shitty product. If you set it up the wrong way, you're going to have a shitty outcome. So what are some examples when an IUL can be effective? And especially when you properly structure your IUL, you do it the correct way. This could give you supplemental income in retirement, and it could be income that you're leveraging tax-free income. The reason why that's important is because it, the, when you're receiving income the right way from an IUL plan or cash value life insurance, and you're receiving income from Roth IRA accounts, the combination of those are not going to increase your provisional income. That's important to note when you also are collecting Social Security income, because if you are not increasing your provisional income, that would result in you receiving more tax-free money. You could have tax-free on your Social Security income, meaning you don't have to pay tax on your Social Security income. You're receiving tax-free income from your Roth, tax-free income from your 7702 plan or your, your IUL plan, your cash value plan, because you structured it the right way. If you do that in the wrong way, and let's say you just hoarded a bunch of dollars towards tax-deferred accounts, and now any dollar that you're taking is not only going to be netting you less dollars, but then that's also going to be adding further taxation on your social security benefit. And it's going to make you struggle and try that much harder to have that ideal retirement, have that ideal retirement dream. Um, another mechanism that's really been popular in, in recent years has been these IUL plans are having these additional long-term care mechanisms that are built into the plan. So some of them do not have any additional cost where you could leverage if you ever came into a long-term care scenario, which is a huge risk as you start nearing retirement or throughout retirement, things that you don't have to try to liquidate your retirement savings to try to pay for that cost of care, the, a home health aid that's needed at your home to help you move around, a uh, assisted living facility, a nursing home, all these different things that Medicare do not cover, you could utilize your IUL plan, a properly structured IUL plan there, there's certain mechanisms and certain living benefits that you could extract the death benefit to pay for that cost of care. So that could obviously put you into a, you know, a better mathematical route, give you that peace of mind throughout retirement if you set this up the right way to make sure that you're also covering the ancillary need that maybe you did not account for, um, you know, that, that your other accounts, that your other traditional IRAs, Roth IRAs, 401k accounts would not affect or would not uh, you know, uh, benefit you. So the last bullet point basically says, even when properly structured, this plan does produce a optimized death benefit when comparing it to other accounts. So like your death benefit, if you properly structure this, your death benefit is always has to be higher than what your cash value is. If your cash value exceeds a certain threshold, your death benefit is going to correlate to this. Known as the cash value quarter is also going to go up with it. So if you're comparing that against an account, such as a Roth IRA or a traditional IRA account. A traditional IRA account is an example. So let's say if you have you know, $300,000 that's sitting in a cash value plan and that cash value plan also has a $500,000 death benefit as opposed to $300,000 that's sitting in an IRA, if you passed away, your IUL plan would provide $500,000 of tax-free benefits to your beneficiaries. That's going to help out your estate plan as opposed to the 300000 in your IRA would be fully taxable at only 300000 to your beneficiaries. So you're going to receive less of a benefit. Your beneficiaries, when you're trying to create some sort of estate planning need, that's going to be less dollars uh, to your beneficiaries than when you're uh, you know, effectively creating these IUL accounts. So in closing, I hope you found value in this video. I hope I was able to give you some sort of benefit to, to really understand the good, the bad, the ugly with IUL plans. Um, at the end of the day, is it an investment? No. An investment typically has some sort of risk associated with it. Typically, it's going to have a limited growth potential. Typically, you're going to try to get a maximized rate of return. That's a growth-related strategy. Can an IUL now be an effective asset? Yes. Can it be an effective asset for retirement planning? Yes because of those tax benefits uh, that IULs possess. 
And when you structure these sorts of plans properly, you're utilizing the correct carrier, you're utilizing the correct loan provisions, you're utilizing uncapped indexing strategies, you're placing the dollars in there with the least amount of uh, cost, the, the least amount of drag on your account, so your contributions could be maximized towards the cash value. Your rate of return could be maximized towards that cash value. So your cash value is increasing as fat as possible, as large as possible, that's obviously a benefit. If you're interested in seeing certain strategies and certain solutions, and you did find value in this video, feel free to give our 1-800 number a call. It's 1-800-566-1002, or schedule a calendar through the calendar link in the description of this video. Reference this video, and you're eligible to have a free 20-minute strategy session with either myself or one of my other advisors. And um, just try to figure out if an IUL is necessary for your situation, um, if you already have an IUL and you want just a second opinion on whether you should get out of it, what are kind of, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, the ugly and, and really do a stress test on these sorts of plants. They could be very good situations. They could be complete disasters. And, you know, just make sure that you're avoiding the most common mistakes. Also, feel free to visit our website, uh, retiresharp.com or fossefinancial.com and subscribe to our YouTube channel, RetireSharp. So you can have access to the most updated videos. Thanks so much, guys.